Of course, as, as soon as I give the signal to begin recording, we get some people coming in. Well, you've ruined my nice quiet room that, that I, I picked, so I would have no audience uh, to interrupt my flow. Um, who here, so this is um, an evolution of a talk that I gave at a PyCon Australia earlier in the year. Did anyone see that talk at PyCon Australia? Okay, that's good or bad, I don't know, we'll find out. Um, so I have a much bigger time slot um, than I did in Australia. So the target of the talk is for people who um, haven't done a lot of computer science engineering degrees. So it's trying to educate people in state machines who don't really know what a state machine is. The drama that I've had is that now that I've got all this time, I have to go and do add on some of the more advanced topics. So the target is still very much people who don't know what a state machine is, and by the end of it, you might not really know what Python is. <laughs> <sighs> but I'm, I'm, I'm still very hopeful that you'll get something out of it. Um, so a few things have changed since that conference. Um, the company I was working for has changed names for reasons of transparency. I don't know. Um, I've decided that the, the talk, I should focus the talk content a little bit. So I've added 20 slides. Um, and I've got a few more graphics. And there's actually a little bit of color in this one. Um, I have done my best to make my slides nice and easy to read, regardless of how uncaffeinated the projector is feeling today, which is fairly. Um, so I need to be really clear up front that the library I'll be talking about, Automat, is not my library. Um, these slides and examples, they're definitely my fault. So what is a state machine? Um, at a very abstract level, a state machine is any thing, we'll, we'll deal with programs, that has a variable that changes values. So you've got a program with foo and it starts off being bar and changes to bats. That is a state machine. Not a very useful one, but it is one. So any program that's got variables that change is a state machine. So all of your programs are state machines, and the code that you are writing to modify uh, the values of those variables, it is handcrafted, it is a handcrafted state machine. Um, <laughs> there is a subset of state machines that can be modeled um, in a structured, formal way. And the reason you want to do that is because if you've, if you've got something that you can model in a nice structured way, it means that it's repeatable. And it means that the process of modeling, coding, um, and testing that can be done in the same way over and over again. So instead of coming up with um, bespoke code for your state machines, you can let the library do most of the work and you can worry about the interesting stuff. Um, often what happens when we're coding something is that we're solving a problem and we are writing a state machine. We don't really think of it in terms of a state machine and it means that some of the problems of state machines aren't apparent to us. So if you've got one variable and it's a Boolean, your state machine can only be in one of two states. Or if it's Python, three states, because it could be none. If you add in a second variable, then you've got three by three, so you've got nine states. How many variables do your programs normally have? A little bit more than two? You get this wonderful combinatoric explosion, where if you had to map out, I've realized now that I'm annoying the video person. 
If you had to map out all the possible states of your program and had to try and test each one of those states, you'd go nuts because it's just not possible. So part of the reason of doing a structured state uh, machine is that you don't have to test all those possible states because you know that there's only a subset of those states that your machine can ever get into. Um, there are state machines that model real world things really well and there's a lot of examples of real world things that engineers have modelled as state machines and instead of the um, it, it, essentially you've designed something to fix a problem and then you've designed a tool and then that tool ends up designing the answer to your future problems. So things like um, traffic lights are really good examples of state machines. Just red, green, orange, flashing maintenance mode. So they've got a certain number of states. Things like train, uh, train guidance systems, for example. Um, the, the way that most train systems are modelled is that you break all of your tracks up into segments. Um, over in Queensland, it's five kilometres segments. And in those segments, you either have no train or one train. That's it. You can never have two trains in the one segment. Um, and it means that when you model it like that, it's really obvious when you get outside of your state machine and something's gone wrong. Um, it's a really good way of um, being able to describe your problem domain at times. You can go to your customer, describe their problem in terms of a state machine, do it in a nice pretty diagram, and then code it. And it means that you've got nice traceability from your pretty diagram that you've done at your requirements analysis, all the way through to your implementation, all the way through to your tests that are generated at the end. Um, from a, a coding perspective, what it means is that the, the biggest advantage is that you don't have to write a lot of um, state testing code. And if you add in new states later on, um, Queensland probably will end up adding like a fourth colour to our traffic lights, for example. You don't have to go and modify all of your previous code. You only have to add in the new transitions from your old states to new states. Um, so there are roughly a thousand libraries on PyPy for implementing and helping implement state machines in Python. Automat um, came to me to be quite interesting because it um, solves a lot of problems in a particular way. Um, it doesn't try to force state machines down your users' throats. When you, when you use Automat to write a state machine, the users of your library class object, they don't see it as a state machine. They see it as a plain old Python object that's got some functions that you call on it that do things. And if you call those functions in the wrong order, you get an error back. Um, so it really does that, that whole object-oriented thing of encapsulating the solution to the problem and hiding it within your object. Um, it's by the author of Twisted. Twisted is a network protocol library for Python. Um, Twisted, um, historically, not so much these days, but historically is used lots and lots of callback codes. Uh, Twisted is an asynchronous um, networking stack. So it means that you send some bytes down the socket and then you wait for the kernel to tell you that they've been sent. Okay, I can send some more. And the way that you do that, um, at least in slightly older days, is that you pass a function that will get called on you. And funnily enough, when 
sending a HTTP request requires you to send a function, get a callback that you've connected, send another function saying, I can write the headers, okay, I can write the headers, send me another function callback um, when I can send the body of the request, send me another function when the um, server has sent me back the response. It actually is kind of easy to get yourself lost in all that stuff. And the author of Twisted designed this state machine library to get themselves out of trouble. Um, one of the interesting ones is TLS or SSL. One of the interesting protocol um, requirements that TLS has is that at any point in time, either peer, because it's not client server, it's, it's very much peer peer, either peer can ask for a renegotiation of the um, underlying encryption keys. So you are, you are reading from the server and the server says, no, nope, um, I need a new encryption key. So you go, oh, okay, I was writing, so I'll keep what I was writing to you at the side and then I'll start this new state machine over here to send, do the three-way handshake with the encryption keys and then I'll send the data that I previously had. And you can very much get into a state where like one of the error codes for SSL write is SSL write wants read. So your program is all set up to do a write and then the server said, no, you've got to do a read now. And the same thing with uh, read wants write. So it's really, really easy in seemingly simple applications to get into states that are very confusing. And instead of writing more and more code to handle all these states as they pop up, the methodical state machine way is to explicitly list those states and explicitly list those transitions between those states and get the code generated for you. So the example that I'm going to use throughout the rest of the talk is a kettle. All state machines have a very special state, the starting state. Um, I'm going to model uh, three states for our kettle. So it's empty, it's full of cold water, and then it's full of hot water. Now, there could be lots and lots of states in there, like it's full of, um, it's full of medium hot water, or it's half full of cold water. That's fine, and that's an ongoing thing. Um, for, the, for the purposes of this talk, these three states provide enough interesting things to look at. But the important thing there is that we are, even when we're doing methodical state machines, we are modeling the real world. It's never going to be a perfect one-to-one -one match with the real world. Um, so we have our transitions from empty to full to uh, back to empty. Um, and if you think of the kettle as one big state machine, so draw a big circle around the whole of it. Um, those inputs to the state machines are fill, boil, and pour. So those, if you've got a, a kettle object, you can think of those fill, boil, and pour as methods on your kettle object. You fill it with water, you press the boil button, and then you pour it. Um, so that's, that's the underlying state machine that we're going to be using as the, the main example for the rest of the talk. Um, I didn't say before, we've got plenty of time, so please ask um, any questions and make sure I remember to um, uh, save the question back to you for the recording. So, it's a kettle, it's got three states, it's got three transitions. How hard could it be to write some code to handle that? Now, I apologise a little bit because I've had to get rid of all the white space to make all of this fit into one slide, but this is a... Um, it's not a terrible first attempt at writing a, a by hand state machine. So if you see our init up there, I've decided to use two variables to hold our state. Whether or not, and they're, they're booleans, so they're nice and simple. Um, whether or not we're full and whether or not we're hot. Um, 
you can see I've got the fill, boil and pour methods. So the three straight state transitions and they've been turned into methods. And I've got some code there that's like you can only boil a kettle if there's water in it um, and if it's cold you can't reboil the, the hot kettle, all that sort of jazz. There are a number of errors with that um, example up there. Um, can anyone spot any of them? Yep. Um, the other one here is it pour. After I pour out the hot water and give you back the hot water, I don't actually reset it to full. So I could keep just keep pouring out the kettle and it apparently would keep pouring out hot water for you. So it's those particular tests. So it's particularly the, the tests to make sure that you're in the right state before you accept a transition. Automat will handle all of that. And it will also handle um, changes to new transitions for you so that you can't muck that up. So now I'm going to go through the example and how you would do it with Automat. So the class that you need is the meth meth ah, methodical machine. Um, we have a kettle and it's under machine equals methodical machine. So the under is definitely important. Um, any of the variables that we have with an underscore uh, start with an underscore, it means that they're private. We don't expect public users of our class to interact with that. So it gets back to that whole idea of encapsulation where we are solving a problem with the state machine and that's internal private details that our customers don't need to know. Um, we declare the three states that we've got. Um, we don't actually have any code in these states. Uh, they are just functions there um, as reference uh, points for the library. Um, so we've got empty, full, and full, uh, full of cold water and full of hot water. Um, and we use the machine decorator to declare them as states. And the only interesting one is the initial equals true. Um, as I said at the start with our first diagram, all of our state machines, they have to have a starting state. Um, if you try to um, instantiate a kettle, uh, if you try to instantiate any of the uh, automat state machines that don't have a start state, it won't let you. So you can have only one, you must have one and only one start state. And this is the code for the um, input functions. So the methods um, on our state machine. Um, again, these don't have any code associated with them. They are reference points that Automat will hang things off. So we haven't really done much so far. Like we've declared our functions, uh, sorry, we've declared our states, we've declared our transitions. But there's no real code hanging anywhere. Um, this is how we wire up our states and our transitions. So the general um, pattern is at the top there. From our start state, upon receiving a certain input, we transition or enter into a new state. So from the empty state, upon receiving a fill input event, we go into the cold, the full cold state. If we're in the full cold state and we receive a boil input, we enter the full hot state. Um, from the full hot state, uh, if we receive a pour, we go into the empty state. So that's, that's like the first real code that we've written and that's the stuff that actually wires up our transitions and our states and links them together. So the only transitions that our state machine can go under are those three transitions there. If the user tries to do any other state transitions, they'll get an error. We've got an example of that coming up. Any questions? What would be an output? <laughs> <laughs> I had to fly here from Brisbane. I'm being a pain in the neck, yes. So, so in the normal case, um, you'd use this kettle, and, and I want to point out here that it looks like um, a, 
a, a popo, uh, a plain old Python object. You instantiate your kettle, you fill it, you boil it, and then you pour it. The result of that is absolutely nada. There's no errors, there's no output, nothing happens. If you try to do something out of order, so we instantiate our kettle and then we boil it without filling it up. Now I've slightly simplified um, this particular um, traceback, I've gotten rid of any um, magical Python stuff in there, but you get back an error from the automat library saying from, um, from the empty state using input boil, there's no transition. So we have not written any code in boil to say we've got to be full of cold water and otherwise error out. Automat, so we've decided, we've declared the three transitions that our state machine can have and Automat won't let anything else happen. So all of that code that we had, like are we full, are we cold, excellent, do all that, you don't have to do that. Um, where things start getting a little bit uglier is the methods that we have on our object. So we want to fill the kettle with a certain amount of water, for example. So what we need to do there is slightly modify our um, fill input. So we've got an amount argument that we've passed along there. Um, now we get onto outputs. So we modify the transition that we've added before. So when we're in empty and we receive a fill, we enter the cold state and one of the outputs that we have is save water. And all save water does is on our kettle, saves underwater to whatever the amount that was passed in. Um, so inputs and outputs um, are chunks of code that get run for us. So basically, when um, somebody does a fill on an empty kettle, and it's, all, it's in the right state, um, all of the functions in output save will get run. And in this case, it'll be save water. So, if we've managed to get water into the kettle, we also want to get the hot water out of the kettle. So here, we modify um, the a pour transition. We add, a, um, we add the return water um, call to outputs. And all return water does is returns self.underwater, which we saved in fill. So that, that part of it is, is quite reasonable it gets a little bit ugly further on. So the drama here is that outputs is a list of functions. So for each of these state transitions, you might want to do multiple things. Um, so the way, that it's, the way that Automat does this is that it gives you a list of functions to run on successful state transitions. So we have initialized a kettle. We've filled it with half a liter of water if only there was a nice library for writing units. Um, are the output functions run in the order you put them? Are the output functions run in the order you put them? Yes. Um, so we filled our kettle with half a litre of water, we've boiled it, and then we've poured it, but we've also printed out the result of that. And that results in a list with half a litre of water. So it sort of makes sense. We've put half a litre of water in and we've poured it, we've boiled it, we've poured it, um, and we get half a litre of water back. But because outputs is a list, we get a list of results. So that's kind of where the PyCon Australia talk finished. Um, so we're into overtime now. So if you were, if you finished your kettle implementation at this point in time, it'd be a little bit funny because when people pour the kettle, instead of getting back half a litre of water, they get back a list of half a litre of water. It's like, what's going on? That, that. 
That might be okay in your application. If you're writing an engineering application and you've got three or four or five state machines all talking together, you might be totally okay with getting a list of results back. That might make sense for you. Um, if you just want a, a plain Python object that returns a number, this is the sort of mess that you've got to start getting into. And this is definitely where Automat stops being as Pythonic as it could be. So, um, we haven't changed the return water function at all there. I'm just putting that there because we're using it. Um, I'm adding a whistle to our kettle that goes off when the, um, when the kettle is boiled. And I'm specifically doing that so that our outputs list has two values in it. The new thing is the collector. So what happens here is that when Automat receives an input, uh, sorry, receives a poor event, is that a, sorry, is that a question? No. Um, when, ah, sorry, when, when we're in the full hot state and we receive a poor event, we'll shift to the empty state, but just before that, we will run blow whistle and return water. And we'll take the results that we get from that and pass it along to collector. So collector, as results, will receive blow whistle, the re result of blow whistle and the result of return water. Now, as a function, as a, a plain Python object, it only makes sense for one of those things to have a result. So it's up to you to design your output functions to only have one of them return a result. Um, otherwise, if you, want it, if you need to return two or three things, then your collector function might return a tuple or it might return a dictionary if you're returning multiple things um, or it might return uh, like a named tuple or something like that. In this case, we've decided that the whistle won't return anything and the only thing we're caring about is the amount of boiled water. So we've slightly generalised it, but basically we get a list of return results. Blow whistle will be a none, and return water will be half a litre of water, for example. And we will um, filter that list, get rid of all the nuns, and just return the first element of that list. So this is our noisy kettle. We fill it with one and a half litres of water. Uh, we boil it, then we print the result. So, we have a print toot toot in the blow whistle. So, whoops. So we know that um, the whistle has been called. Obviously, if it was a real kettle, we'd actually hear the whistle, but I'm not going to do that on slides. Um, I'm not very keen on presentations that have a, a kettle whistle. Um, and we get a poor result back, which is just one and a half litres. It's not a list of one and a half litres, it's just 1.5. Um, one of the other things that Automat has um, recently sort of grown some nicer tools for is the ability to visualise the state machine. Um, and it's, it's kind of an interesting thing because the, the, the way that you mostly do these things is you actually start off drawing your diagram like I did at the start and drawing your arrows and then transferring them to code. This is kind of the other way around, where you've got your code and you're printing out your state diagram machine from that. Um, oh, that doesn't look too good. Apologies, I haven't actually looked at that on that projector before, and I should have turned on the um, black and white mode. Um, so I'm not a very visual person. You'll see the border around empty is slightly thicker. That's indicating that it's the special start state rather than just saying, you know, start with an arrow next to it. Um, we've got our uh, two other states, the full hot and the full cold. We've got our transitions, boil, fill and pour, and we've got the outputs associated with them. So, um, it's one of those things like, if, you, if you're not entirely sure that you've coded up your state machine in the right way, um, the visualisation might be able to help you figure out that you haven't done something wrong. Um, but it's the sort of thing where you can sit down and go through those state transitions and make sure that um, 
you haven't done obvious things, like if there was a state sitting off at the side that didn't have any transitions going into it, or it only had transitions going into it, you couldn't get out of it, for example, that could, be, that could indicate a bug, depending on what you're modeling. Um, there are other things that you can do with Automat. So it will, so if, you, if you're doing an online thing, um, an online thing, excellent. I started doing computers before there was this whole networking thing, I'm sorry. It's just a big bad fad that I'm waiting to go away. Um, if you're doing an online sales system, a um, person logs into a website, they have a, a login session, they've got a cart associated with that login session, they're adding a couple of products to that. Maybe they um, get called away from the computer for whatever reason and that cart times out, they haven't touched their computer for 20 seconds. Um, you've got a state machine there, so you've got the not logged in state, you've got the logged in state, you've got the cart, you've got each of the products being added to the cart. If you're using an automat state machine there, if that person times out, um, you can serialise that state machine into a, data, into a database record, write it out to the database, and the next, you know, the next day when that person logs in, you can deserialise that entire state machine back up and it can have all of their um, peculiar shopping habits in the cart. So all of the things like um, discount vouchers, whether or not the person has um, gone to other sites before they've come to your site, whether or not they've followed a referral link, all of that stuff um, can be modelled as a, a state machine and can be stored in the database and brought back when you need it. That is the Automat um, GitHub URL. They do have some quite reasonable docs. Um, I was more going for um, docs for people who've not used state machines at all, so I hope that was helpful. Um, and I probably have lots of time for questions, I think. So the, so the visualised graph and what formats it can go in, you can definitely output that in a much more, um, I'll just repeat the questions, it's cool. Um, you, it definitely has a lot of output options. Um, Um, so, there's SVG, um, sorry, SVG and JSON. So, JSON might be the interesting one if you were going to do some particular things on it, like if you were going to actually try and parse it for, for having data and stuff like that, for sure. Oh, that. So, can you nest state machines? You might want to nest, so I'll, I'll, I'll try and describe nesting state machines. Um, when, without, um, without trying to cause too much um, of an international incident, I suppose, when engineers are coding things, it's very common for engineers, and I'm meaning electrical engineers here, it's very common for them to use state machines to describe everything, because it's a known system, um, it's a, a process that you can follow and you can take your analysis and derive a correct system at the end of the day. One of the things that you might want to do with that is that if you've been in the industry long enough and you've seen a particular tool or a particular widget, you might have a state machine just for that particular widget. And when you're solving a larger problem, you might want to reuse some of those widgets and you might want to reuse some of those state machines and draw them together. There's no explicit support for nesting state machines um, in Automat, but that's sort of okay because if each of those state machines is just a plain old Python object, 
um, then they can call any Python objects they want. So there's nothing in, explicit in there, but you can do it yourself. Sorry, there a whole bunch of hands went up uh, prior. I just. Um, so that will, that will, so how do you get the um, results? So when you run k dot, uh, kettle dot pour, the result that it returns is um, the list of results. So, um, so in this case, when the transition from full hot to, to empty has happened, it will automate, will run, blow whistle, and return water. And it will then pass those along to filter out none, and then it will return um, those results. So from a user's point of view, when you run uh, kettle.pour, you will get back 1.5 as the result. If you don't have a collector, you'll get back a list of results that you've got in outputs. Um. So you don't. And so if you fill it with kettle, then you've got too much water. The water would go everywhere. You probably want to raise an exception, right? Yep. So how are they transitioned? Uh, sort of, does it happen before your function's called or afterwards? And how are exception handled? So, so that's quite a long question. No, 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 no. That's fine. I hope you don't <laughs> so, so one part of that question is. Yes, I'm, I'm, try, I'm trying to. <laughs> no, 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 it's, it's, it's not a bad question at all. So, so one half of the question is on um, validating inputs um, that you're parsing. So like if it's a two litre jug and we accept three litres of water, how does Automat help with that? Um, short answer, it doesn't. So you still have to do some checking there. Um, the other way of dealing with it though is that you could ha it sort of depends. Like, if you're modelling a industrial kettle that self-fills, it will have a sensor, and you will model that sensor as part of your state machine. And part of the state transitions that you've got is that you can um, you can only keep the tap on while the sensor's off. So it sort of depends. So. In this simple example, there's nothing stop like if the if the kettle has a five litre capacity and we put six litres of water in it, there's nothing in there that will cover that. Right. But can you raise an exception as part of your input? For your input validation, yes, because it is just at the end of the day, it is just a, a Python object. Right. If you want to validate your inputs um, and, and raise an exception, that is totally a thing you can do. So I've not used it directly. I've mostly used it through Twisted. Um, so I, I, I do I do use Twisted uh, for work problems, and that's that's basically where I've seen debugging a Twisted problem, and then you come across this state machine thing, and then you've got to work out the state machine thing uh, to figure out um, what's going on. Um, so I have not um, I've not used it directly for my own problems. No, I've only used it um, through Twisted, and when they, so, so essentially Twisted is one of the older Python um, projects and they are at a point now where they've got some really gnarly bugs and they're trying to fix these bugs and one of the things that they're doing is rewriting a lot of their code in terms of state machine so that they don't have um, if statements at the start of their functions making sure they're in the right state, making sure all the parameters are correct. They make the state machine do all that and they have found a number of bugs um, by doing that. Is there a, a way of doing like an end statement so you end up with like, so you get into that sort of state and you know the program is finished? Um, Automat does not have an end state, no. There's, there's nothing like uh, there's nothing like a particular end state um, that they have. Um, 
There's nothing, I mean, it, it sort of depends on, on the way that you want to do it, but you could certainly have, um, the, like the easiest thing would be just have an internal variable and, and set it and then check it later. Um, I have all the time in the world. Is there any like, automatic test generation? Are there any automatic test generators? So they have, they have some built-in code that helps generate tests, but it's not quite there yet. Um, but the thing is that it means that um, because you're using the library, what it basically means is that when you've, when you've divided your system up into this way, you can target your testing at the particular states. So instead of having a, bunk, instead of having a plate of spaghetti code and having to work out all the different ways of testing that, you know that the states that you have to test, you've got all your three states and you've got all the transitions coming out to and into those states. Um, so they do have some support for generating um, like a, a list of functions that you'll need to fill in. So it's like, you know, these, these are the states and these are the transitions that you'll need to test. Um, but there's nothing there that um, there's nothing there that automatically does does that. They they have some support, but not full support. Uh, can, the um, can the state itself return the output? Um, so. One of the interesting aspects, so the way that Automat is designed is that the resulting object that you have is meant to look like a plain old Python object and the user is not meant to know that there's a state machine underneath it. So there is no simple way of asking an Automat state machine what state it's in. They've deliberately made that as hard as possible. So there's no simple function that you can um, call on Automat to say, what state are you in? Are you full, empty, or, co or whatever? Um, and it, they've done that specifically so that you don't end up producing uh, a kettle that you have to drive like a state machine. They want, it to be, they want your kettle objects to be driven like a plain Python object. So there's no real easy way to get the current state of a state machine. I've, I've sort of avoided your question there. Um, I mean, you can, you can make the output functions return anything you like, but they make it very hard to work out what the current state of the state machine is. Uh, if, if you add a particular function that only gets called for particular uh, transitions, that's probably the easiest way of doing that. So there is, um, there's some stuff that I haven't looked at yet, which is some tracing code that they've got, so that if you're trying to debug a problem um, and you've got a state machine, it'll actually show you what state it's in, what inputs it received to change to another state. Um, so perhaps the tracing code is the right place to look at for that. Um, so, um, can you also look at, so, can you also look at the valid transitions out of a state? Yes. So, you can output that visualization in any of a way of a number of things and you will be able to parse that for sure, definitely, yeah. Um, I'm, I, so, I've not looked at the, um, at the JSON form but I presume that it's mostly going to be the reverse. So it's, going to, it's almost certainly going to be source destination, so you're probably going to have to read it and, and do a reverse um, index on it. But it's, 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 yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was just uh, thinking about what you said about the use of visualisation where you might not see a state that hasn't been connected to the other state, and that made me wonder does it in fact have a form of static analysis which allows you to, uh, which highlights uh, space for you to find the kind of new reach or 
it does have it does have some um, error checking like that. So when you if you try to instantiate a kettle that doesn't have um, any transitions, or if you try to add in um, like a repeated transition, um, like if you've got two states and you add in two transitions that look exactly the same, it will error out on those things. So that's I mean that's that's runtime, but that's at instantiation time that it will do that. Um, so there. So there is some form of static or early runtime uh, checking on it, but there's no tool that you can say, here's Python, run MyPy over it and, and work it out. There's nothing like that, I don't think. Okay. So how do you document your kettle? What more do you need than that? <laughs> um, how do I document the kettle? So um, because it is a plain Python object. Um, you can put um, all of the documentation code um, in fill uh, in that um, doc string there. So, so the API for your kettle is fill, um, fill empty and boil, and you can add um, those doc strings as you see fit. So you can document it there. Okay, thanks very much.